Okay, we're back now with tray number four, the final tray of my slides are a total of 484 slides and uh, I'll proceed to narrate the last tray. This first shot shows a group of army soldiers from the first army and they were on maneuvers in 1939 all through the area of Morrisonville, Katyville, Woods Mills, Saranac, Schuyler Falls, all through the Schuyler Falls Macomb Reservation. And these are guys that had a vehicle that were camouflage. Now I have a series of these and these were given to me by Mr. Jim Hutchinson of the Peru. Jim used to live in Schuyler Falls and he was the former, he is the former superintendent of the Peru School District. I was very grateful that Jim gave me these because I have memories of these maneuvers that went on. These guys just lived right out there in the wilderness all over the place digging foxholes and so on preparing for a war to come which eventually did come World War II and the first army was a very prominent army in the war of World War II. Now these are some of the guys in trenches. Notice their packs, uh, all their equipment. There they are with the artillery. First Army maneuvers in the Plattsburgh area. Here they are with a pontoon bridge across the Saranac River at Katyville. Now these are the tanks that they had. And this was up in Schuyler Falls on the Macomb Reservation. You notice the soldier sitting down on the side of the road and the uh, three-wheeled bike that he has there. But see the tanks? They were still not very heavy-duty tanks at that time. And the captions at the bottom pretty much describe what these vehicles are. And the cavalry. We didn't have that particular type of cavalry raids in World War II but they were still possible. There they are at the mess, getting ready to have chow, one of the modern tanks at that time. There they are with a camouflage cannon or a 75 millimeter gun. There they are marching. Uh, they used to march in some cases from Plattsburgh up through the Schuyler Falls up by the Irish Settlement Road. Here they are breaking out of the underbrush. Here they are on that Bailey Bridge, that pontoon bridge, at the Katyville again. This is a house that I believe is still on Macomb, in Macomb Park. As you're going into Macomb Park to go to the picnic area, uh, right by the gate to the right was a little white house, this house right here. And that was the headquarters for General Hugh Drum, who was in charge of all of the maneuvers that were going on in the area, and after whom Camp Drum, Fort Drum, was named. This is the former railroad station in Morrisonville. It was located on the south side of the tracks on the west side of Route 22B, as you're leaving Morrisonville and go across what was the railroad cross. The building in the background that you see with the garage door open was the former Sheffield milk plant. This tells a little bit about the Morrisonville area. This is uh, at the railroad station just to the north of the rail, uh, to the west of the railroad station and that uh, building in the back is where my father used to store that motor car that you see there. The little boy in the front is my son Michael, who by this time has now retired as a colonel from the Marine Corps. Here's a picture of a train going across that railroad bridge at Katyville that you saw previously. You notice how small the engine is and the different style that old steam locomotive was in comparison to the later one. This is a railroad wreck in 1916 there in Katyville, and these pictures were taken by Mr. Wilford Rock. Remember, at that time they didn't have 
all the heavy equipment to be able to use to bring these these cars and engines up to uh, back up onto the tracks with. It was pretty much manual labor and the only equipment they had would be another engine. If they could get it to the wreck site, they would build a track to it to where the wrecked cars were and help to pull them out in that way. As you can see right there, there's a car up on the track, but they're building a new track to go to get the engine that you see in the background, try to get that out of there. There's another shot. Here's some of the men working there. And Mr. Wilford Rock and his brother carried water to these guys while they were working there. There are two engines, and as you can see, that one engine on the right and is being connected to the other one, perhaps trying to pull the other engine out of the gorge. There's some more guys working on there. This was taken down at the Katyville Railroad Station. This slide shows, was taken from the sand road about a quarter of a mile to the west of the school and it is now a big potato field and sometime cornfield owned by Mr. Ducat from Katyville. That little dome that you see off to the left is what's left of the old railroad bed that used to run to Katyville, Dannemora, Line Mountain and Lake Placid. And to the left, there's another little railroad bed that used to run over to the pulp mills that you saw previously. Now these are the Buckley girls. Mr. Buckley is the one who lived on Mason Street just past the railroad crossing on the right. This is a more modern version of the railroad, as you'll notice that those are diesel engines in comparison to the old steam engines that used to be there. This is a bridge that was located north of Schuyler Falls, between Schuyler Falls and the Schuyler Falls Rain, the picnic area. And this was down in the gorge, and it was a place called Norrisville. There was a little community there with an iron forge and grist mill, and uh, I don't know what else they had. They had a store there, and these people that are pictured, are their name are listed at the top. Uh, Mr. Fred Pierce, for instance, uh, was the supervisor at that time, and he was Roy Pierce's father that I mentioned recently. Mr. Emery is the guy that I told you lived down there in Morrisonville with the funeral parlor, store, skunk farm, apple orchard, uh, you name it, he had it. This is the old Woods Mills Bridge in 1904 when the river jammed up and pushed the bridge off its foundation. It was located just a, about where the present bridge is now. And in the background on the left is the house that uh, Mr. Bird owns now, the stone house that you saw in one of the previous slides. And I believe right up on the far end of the bridge on the left is the old hotel that you saw where Jess Jock and his family were sitting on the porch. And there's another shot of the bridge at that time. I don't know who the man is that was here. But that's quite an ice jam. Here's what's there now, some difference in years. This is when the bridge was, the new bridge was dedicated, and I don't really know the year of it. Uh, starting from left, Bob Butler, who was the legislator from Area 6, that included Saranac, the town of Schuyler Falls, the village of Dannemora, and next to him was a legislator Pavone from Plattsburgh, and then legislator Bob Garrow from the town of Plattsburgh. Then in the next one with the black suit on was uh, the legislator from the town of Ellenburg, Sam Trombley. 
The next man next to him was our supervisor at that time, Reginald Dermody. Next to Reg is the supervisor from the town of Plattsburgh, Art Lefebvre. And I don't know who the gentleman is behind Art Lefebvre, but the one to the right was uh, the Clinton County engineer who lived in Peru and I don't recall his name at this time. There is the Woods Mills Bridge, and if you look, you will see the boom of an old shovel, power shovel, like you saw in previous slides. When the bridge gave out, and they were trying to run that power shovel across there, well, certainly it wasn't made to hold such a heavy piece of equipment. And fortunately, there wasn't anybody killed when that happened. And I don't know who was operating the power shovel at the time, but that was right over the place that you saw the old dam in the river and the old sawmill. This was the Katyville Bridge, right at the intersection of the hard scrabble at the Harney Bridge in Katyville. That was August 26, 1946. Uh, a load of potatoes started to go across the bridge and just didn't make it. Luckily, there again, no one was killed or injured for that matter. You're looking from the south side toward the north, looking toward Katyville, the village of Katyville. That's what's there today. That was the bridge that they replaced the old one. This is the old bridge at Kent's Falls. It is now closed, and I've sent a photograph of this to Marvin. I don't have a slide, I believe, of this. While I was home this summer in 2003, I took a picture of that dedication marker at the top, and I left a note with Marvin if he could get permission to get that off there before the bridge is demolished. Perhaps it could be cleaned up and left as a monument. And there is a close-up of what it says. It names the people involved, and that bridge was built in 1898. That's the old bridge in Morrisonville. That was the, the old red bridge that I used to fish from when I was a kid, and it was replaced around 1948 or 49. And on the right, you will see a handrail. Well, that was a, uh, a walk, a sidewalk for us to walk across. Now, when you walked across the bridge, you understand the bridge had all wooden planking. They were, I believe, four-inch planks. And uh, if a heavy vehicle went across while you were walking across, these short planks where the sidewalk was would sort of dance up and down. You had to be careful that you wouldn't trip. And that's looking from the town of Plattsburgh side toward the town of Schuyler Falls. There's another shot of it. Many good memories I have of fishing from there. Here it is when it was jacked up and it was moved to the north of the where it was located and it was used during construction of the new bridge, the Green Bridge, that's there now, and we were able to use the old bridge until the new one was completed. And as you'll see in the right-hand corner, that's the back of the old Baptist Church and the former post office and general store of Bill Light. And this is before the EPA became visible and stringent on their demands. That shows the bulldozer from the town of Schuyler Falls with Schuyler Ormsby on it. And what he's doing is he's piling up stones on both sides of the river to make the river deeper in the middle to prevent the ice jams. And uh, during the years that they did this, we didn't have any more problems. From 1934, we didn't have another jam until somewhere around, I believe, 1981. So you see the value of making that river deeper and more swift flowing water. Well, now there are so many stones that are out 
from the point of the river, if you go across the bridge and look on the north side of the bridge, you'll see where there's a great big point of stones going out. What's going to happen eventually with that, we don't have any idea. But there again, that helps to make these darn ice jams that come about ever so often. And that road on the other side of the river is the road that goes over to the Van Etten house in the background, way over in the left-hand corner. This is when we had the dedication bridge of the uh, marker up in Schuyler Falls. And uh, all the people in the picture there, Bob Bruno, who was the county legislator, uh, Jim Hutchinson, who was a legislator from Peru at that time, but also a very avid historian from the town of, for the town of Schuyler Falls, gave me an awful lot of information. Then there was uh, Mrs. Barber, Bernard Barber, who was the supervisor, that's his wife. And then there's Addie Shield, Bob Wachowski, who was uh, on the town board, uh, Jeff Duquette, Mrs. Wachowski, Mrs. Hutchinson. I don't know who the young person is in the front, and I think she is young Hamill, Miss Hamill. She's Sherm Hamill's daughter. Sherm is in the back. He was in the, on the town board. Shirley Balco, who was the town clerk, and the guy with the glasses in the back was Bernard Barber, who was the supervisor. The gentleman in the front with the uh, beard is Colonel Wexel, who lives up on Route 22B, and to his left or right, his wife, and in the back of Mrs. Wexel is Mike Burgess, who took over as historian after I left. This next scene shows uh, Sherm Hamill on the left, Bernard Barber, the supervisor in the middle, and Bob Wachowski on the right. They had just unveiled uh, the marker. This next group was when we had uh, dedicated the marker at Woods Mills. And there are uh, members of the town board as well as the historical society. That marker is right at the southeast corner of the Woods Mills Bridge. Uh, Bob Bruno on the left. Bernard Barber, Addie Shields, Bernard's wife, Shirley Balco, myself, Leona Gadway, Wally Gadway, and George St. John. Members, they we were members of the Historical Society. This is unveiling the marker at the Broadwell Farm and at Sherm Hamill taking the cover off and Bernard Barber standing on some wood to get the marker off. Here's the group that was present at the time that we dedicated that marker. And there were uh, a good number of descendants of the Broadwells who were in the picture. In fact, on the first gentleman on the left is Keith Broadwell, Jr. And um, he is now in possession of the Broadwell Farm. I can't name all of the other people that are in there, but they are some some of them are descendants of the Broadwell family. There's members of the town board and legislators. Jeff Duquette, Bob Wachowski, Bernard Barber, Sherm Hamill, and Bob Bruno. Bob being the county legislator representing us. And here again, this is the Broadwell family. I'm not sure who the gentleman with the dark glasses is or the next lady, but in the background is Keith Broadwell, the lady in the front with the white hair, Mrs. Russell Broadwell. The gentleman with the cane in the front is Keith Broadwell Sr. The young lady is Keith Broadwell Jr.'s daughter and his son. This is when we had the dedication of the marker that is down on the west side of the Morrisonville Bridge. Here you see Craig Russell dressed up in a one of the colonial type uniforms and he's got his powder musket there in front and as we go on you'll see where he fires the musket 
This is the location here. He's getting ready to fire the musket. This is the location, the approximate location, where the British tried to cross the river in the War of 1812 to burn down the sawmill that was run right there on the edge of the river on this side by Mr. Broadwell. Uh, his name was Dan Broadwell. Well, when the British, they saw the British coming, they took the planks off the river, off the bridge, so that they couldn't come across, and they fired muskets uh, through the openings in the side of the house somehow, and apparently they wounded some British soldiers. According to the marker there, they killed a horse or two. Uh, the people in the picture, uh, I think I can describe them all. Shirley Balco with the camera. The next lady is Bernard Barber's wife, Dorothy. Uh, then Bob Bruno, Bernard Barber, George St. John, Wally Gadway, Leona Gadway, my granddaughter, uh, Maria, and Craig Russell. Here he has just fired off his shot. And here's everybody again and I happened to sneak in on that picture. This is the cutting of the cake. When we got back to the town offices, town hall, we had a cake, and uh, there's Bob Bruno, Addie Shields, and Bernard Barber. That's what the cake looked like. Uh, that was made down at Rombach. The lady did a beautiful job showing the sawmill, the grist mill in Schuyler Falls with the dam, I think it was a super job, and as I recall, there was no problem in eating the cake. It was very good. Here's the lady that decorated the cake, and that's Mr. Rombach with her. This is when they had the uh, bicentennial committee for the county, and each township was asked to put in some segments for the parade. Well, this here shows Roy Pierce being driven by Nancy Kane and Roy being our el one of our elder citizens at the time. He was only around 93, I believe, and he's wearing his grandfather's hat. Peter Weaver, the man that you saw previously with the horse, that hat, of course, is pretty old. And here's a contingent from the Morrisonville Elementary School. There's a contingent from the Morrison Community Church, and they're being driven by Raymond Lavernway. This was a group from our first descendants of our first settlers, Nancy Donahue, who lives out on Cumberland Head. And I don't think they are all of her children, but a couple of those, I believe, are hers. They're being driven by George Seymour, George, our present highway commissioner. Here's a group from St. Alexander's School. Uh, this is the end of our contingent. Vernon Bruno is driving this, and uh, we uh, constructed an outhouse with cardboard and a little wooden roof on it, and as you see, circa 1848. And as we move along, you'll see we've come a long way. And then on the back, it says the end. That's the end of our contingent. That was on Margaret Street in Plattsburgh. This is the group, the committee, that worked on getting that contingent together and putting everything to, in order. I will try to name them all. From the left, I am standing there next to Nancy Kane, Mrs. Decker, then Bonnie Yop, Shirley Balco. Can't remember the young man's name in the front. Then there's uh, Carol Sorrell, Bernard Barber in the background, John Sorrell, Joe Seymour, Wally Gadway, and then in the back on the left is was Councilman Ken LaPlante and then Vernon Bruno. Now that shows Roy Pierce standing outside of the little outhouse, and you'll notice the uh, Sears and Roebuck catalog hanging there for its general purposes. And this shows a Miss Rock. She used to live at the intersection of the Irish Settlement Road 
and Mason Street, the red house on the south east corner of Mason Street. She was at that time, I believe, 95 or 96 years old, though she was probably the oldest citizen, the elderly, most elderly citizen that we had. Uh, she didn't move around a whole lot in the township, and she spent some over 40 years uh, keeping house for the Lobdells up on Route 22B. Never got married. And later in life, she kept house for uh, her nephew, Ernest Rock, and his children. This was in 1981 when they had the flood in the wintertime, and that's a group of guys going out there and blasting out the jam in the river down by the small bridge as you're going out of Morrisonville at the intersection of the Banker Road and Route 22B. Another shot of the blast. Here's a guy out there planting some dynamite in a very precarious position, I would say. That shows you how the ice built up and uh, just backed water up all over the place on the other side of the river, which uh, was where the little settlement was that was washed out with the ice jam of about 1994 or 95 and actually destroyed that little building community at the end of River Street. This is a house that's still in Morrisonville. It's the second house from the corner of the intersection of Emory Street and Main Street. It's next to what used to be Dagenau's store. There were a family of Hayes's living there at that time. I don't know the exact time of it, but that picture I was given, or in fact I purchased from one of the people living in town who had several pictures, and that was one of them. This is a photo showing the location of the old dam on the Riley Brook just off Shingle Street between Shingle Street and the Ram Road. And that's where Shingle Street got its name because there was a shingle mill. This is a little gravestone that we found in the Hammond Cemetery, which is just south of the Broadwell Road and west of the Mason Street, behind uh, a house owned by Donald Recor. Uh, it was in many broken pieces. I did what I could to put it back together and put it in a frame. And uh, I think the town board, or Bernard Barber, was going to finish restoring it when I left and put it back in place. I don't know if that was done or not. And this is a picture of a power bill that Roy Pierce had back in December of 1926. And if you'll notice the price, $3.12 for one month. Now at that time, and I remember these years, that uh, even back into the early 30s when this was happening, the meter man would come around and read the meter. And in most cases, the meter was inside the house. And he would take the meter reading he would tell you how much it cost, and he had a bag that he hung over his shoulder, and he had money in there. And so you paid the meter man each time he came around to get the, uh, to get the money. He would take the money when he read the meter. Now this is a, uh, a news item of February 9, 1942, when the Brookside Hotel burned. Now, the Brookside Hotel was located down across the small bridge, the Salmon River Bridge, the Salmon Brook Bridge, at the intersection of the Banker Road and Route 22B. And it was located right at the very intersection to the west of the former Dorn's Transportation Truck Company that was still there. And this tells about the fire when it happened and uh, all about it. Fortunately, no one was hurt. Someone was forced to jump off the roof. 
but uh, there were no actual injuries or serious injuries. And I remember when that burned, uh, two or three days later, some of my buddies and I were down there rummaging around, not really, shouldn't have been there, but we were rummaging around, and we found uh, about three nickels that had been forged together from the heat of the frame of the flames. And one of the guys took the pack, took them home, and I imagine they probably disappeared over the years. This shows you the price of the old press, Plattsburgh Daily Republican. That was before they merged with the Plattsburgh Daily Press, and now they are known as the Plattsburgh Press Republican. These are some of the items who the editor and treasurer and all that, the president. It's uh, just an old item. This is the present town hall when we were having our first town-wide rummage sale. And uh, it happened that it was a beautiful day and we had a nice turnout. I don't know whether this is still happening or not, but it was fun to have this happen. This is another shot of it, the Morrisonville ambulance on the left. They took blood pressures that day. I've forgotten who was running the hot dog cart on the right but they were good eating. There's the ambulance. The little orange structure on the left that you see is was our historical society's structure. And we had a few items here that uh, we gave out a uh, few things and tried to entice people to join our society. Apparently that was the end of the film on that roll. There's a shot of what was in our little historical room. In the background, it was a nice handmade quilt, and I'm not sure that may have come from Sylvia Burgess. We sold raffles on that, raffle tickets on that. And on the left is a little cradle that I built that we raffled off. And we had various other items that were located there. And we had a lot of fun. We, we even uh, made a group of whimmy diddles that we sold and made a little money for our organization. And I don't recall who that lady is that's there, but I think she is Mrs. DiOrio or Del Oreo. And that's her husband in the front. Uh, later in the day, he put on a demonstration of making cider. These are, this is a group of books and pamphlets that we had that were down on at the town hall during that day and uh, they were for people to look at and they stayed on display all day. Here's Mr. DiOrio and his son making cider. These are the ironware kettles and pots and things that George St. John had a collection of. He had one massive collection. It was great. These are more people out there. Uh, I guess they were maybe selling apples or something at that point. And there's the uh, part of the committee that worked to make the shelter, put it together. Uh, myself on the right, the Oreo, Del Oreo to my right. And then uh, I can't remember the gentleman's name next to that. Then Shirley Balco and her grandson, Mrs. Delorio, and the two Delorio boys. And this shows the part of the playground that's there now. And it has been expanded since I moved away. But just to the left of that, where there's a little culvert that crosses the road, when I was a volunteer fireman, we didn't have water systems in the village. And we had various pumping stations that we could drive our truck to, uh, drop off hose at the fire and drive the truck to the pumping station and start putting out the fire that way. There was a water hole there at that time. And we used to drive 
If there was a fire, say, on top of the hill, we'd go up and drop the hose off at the top of the hill, start off with the end of the hose, and run it all the way down the road, and hook it up to the pumper and pump the water out of the water hole that was there. This is the present water system we have in Morrisonville. It was much better than using the old hand pumps and wells that we used to have, and then with the electric pumps that we had, we always had problems with. This is a meeting that I had one afternoon with some of the senior citizens trying to gain more information from these people who had been around town for many, many more years than I had. And I was taping the conversation, and I've sent these tapes to uh, Marvin Connors, and he can use them as he so desires. Uh, looking in the photograph with the guy with his back to me was Wally Gadway. Wally had been uh, my eighth grade school teacher and we became real great friends uh, and Wally joined this historical society once I proposed that we should get one going. Uh, to Wally's left uh, was Roy Pierce, and Roy at that time I think was about 93. Next to him was Mrs. Sidden, Helen Sidden, and next to her was my mother-in-law, Frances DeLorme. I can't tell who was on the other side of her from this place, from this position. And then there was Mrs. Bouye, Mrs. Esburn Bouye and Esburn himself. Esburn was only about 90 at that time. And uh, during that summer, Esburn had a problem with his car, so he took it to Peru to have it repaired. And he decided he would take a little exercise, and he walked from Peru down to his house, which was down into the town of Plattsburgh, uh, just before you get to the intersection of the Banker Road and Route 22B. Imagine at his age being able to do that. He was a very active man. Next to him was Mrs. Jenny Bouye. Uh, she was the mother of eight Bouye boys. A very hard-working lady, very religious lady. She lived all her life there in Morrisonville. Then on the other side, facing is Leonard Gadway. Leonard was my high school business teacher. He was the justice of the peace, became the town supervisor. Leonard was a good friend of mine. Next to him was Wilford Babe Trombley, who for a period of 30 or more years was the town clerk in the town of Schuyler Falls, a very good friend of mine as well. I enjoyed being with these people because they were such a wealth of knowledge for the community. And that's why I was trying to tape these things before they passed on. And since that time, looking into this photo, there is not one of those people still alive. And that was about 1991 or 92. And that's me standing on the right with the red sweat. Here we are again from a different angle. See, they're looking at pictures that I was passing around. And they're trying to identify who, are, who the people are in the picture. The lady that I couldn't recognize before with the blue sweater is Mildred Chase. Mildred is the only survivor of that whole group. See, they're, they're looking at these pictures and everybody is getting a little information out of them. It's, it's jogging their memories and that's why I'm able to get some of the information that I was able to get. These photos, by the way, were taken by my son, Patrick. There I am talking with Esburn, Bouye, Wilford Trombley, and Leonard Gadway. See, the picture that Leonard is looking at is one of the slides that you saw previously of uh, the school kids in front of the old school, in front of the old school building. Now here we are just having cake, and the guy with the cup in his hand is Mr. Alfred Vaughn. He wasn't able to get there earlier, but uh, Alfred is uh, Gordy Little's father-in-law. And uh, 
Alfred had a lot of information of the area as well. This is a different meeting that I had. The gentleman in the background is Andrew Broadwell. He's the guy that brought the box that you see on the right and that you previously saw the photo of the inside. He is talking with Mildred Chase. The lady in the front is Gabriel Ducat. She was the historian before I was, and we used to work together when she was historian and then after I was historian, a fine lady. And the guy in the background on the right is my son, Patrick. And that's the end of tray number four. Uh, it's been my privilege to be able to donate this to the historian in the town of Schuyler Falls. And I've spent many hours here narrating and recalling some of the names that I had previously forgotten. I hope that those that have seen these slides will have enjoyed them, that they will have gained some interest and uh, knowledge of the town of Schuyler Falls. If I have the opportunity later and if I find old photographs that I can make slides of, I will do so and send them at a later time. I'm now just finishing this up on October the 5th, 2003 in my home in Pinellas Park, Florida. I have many, many fine memories having done all of these slides and having had meetings with everybody in the past. Good luck, Marvin, and to anyone else who takes over after you've retired.